Hi, uh, this week you're reading about cognitive changes in middle childhood and in early adolescence. Uh, here's a good example of why I think it's useful to go into adolescence. We've been using Piaget's work as a framework and the third of his four stages, the stages of concrete operations, occurs during middle childhood, about from ages 7 to 12, but the last of Piaget's stages, formal operations, begins in early adolescence and actually continues into adulthood. So it makes sense to read something about that and read how formal and concrete operations are similar and different from each other. There are other topics around cognition that are also pretty interesting and that change quite a bit in middle childhood. We may not continue them in your readings into adolescence quite so much, but uh, clearly um, there are changes in areas such as language use and understanding, in uh, ability to use attentional um, uh, awareness, and uh, also the ability to use memory processing to help retain information purposefully. Anyway, let's start with Piaget. Piaget describes the concrete and the formal operational stages as having something in common, and that is the use of operations. Operations are kinds of schemas. That is, they are logical ways of understanding and making sense of the world around us. And when applying those logical ways, children in the school age years and then into adolescence and adulthood tend to make what we call objective sense of the world that we're a part of. I'll give you an example. Younger children, pre-operational children, have a fairly subjective sense of time. That is, uh, they don't understand that well the concept of a month or uh, a season or a year. Uh, they relate to them perceptually. A season is, for example, when it snows and it's cold in winter, uh, not a given number of days or a given number of weeks. But school-age children approach time in a more objective kind of way. They, first of all, come to be able to tell time. That is, they can look at a clock and, and know the difference between minutes and hours and, uh, and in terms of a calendar between days and weeks and months. So they tend to conceive of time as consisting of specific objective units that are shared by everyone. Now this is quite an, an improvement cognitively. It allows them, for example, to plan things in the future. Oh, I have to do something by next Thursday or Christmas is in three weeks. At the same time, children's understanding of time is very concrete. Uh, for example, they might think that time is actually cut up into days and weeks and months. Uh, you and I, of course, know that that's not the case, right? In other words, we understand that time is an abstraction, that our calendar, for example, is not the way that time is cut up into a year, uh, that different societies have had different calendrical systems. Uh, some are lunar, for example, uh, the Chinese New Year or the Jewish calendar, uh, uh, Ramadan in the Islamic calendar, which is lunar as well, so that the, the actual number of months and when those dates fall may vary from year to year. In a similar kind of way, uh, some terms that were very commonly used at one time may no longer be used today to describe time. We're all familiar with what a week is, for example, uh, but we generally don't talk in terms of a fortnight. I know you're thinking, what is a fortnight? Well, it's about a two-week period of time. And of course, when people traveled at slower rates, you know, when it took them quite a while to go by stagecoach in the 1700s from one place to another, a fortnight's amount of time meant something. Uh, I'll give you another kind of example, because a lot of the abilities that cognitively are gained in concrete operations are abilities that allow us to uh, manipulate the world in clear, objective ways that we can then compare with each other. We have uh, feet for measuring length and inches within those feet for comparing different lengths to each other. But again, while a concrete operational child might think the world is divided into feet and yards 
and miles, for example. But we as adults know that uh, distance can be cut up in all different kinds of ways. Uh, so we have kilometers as well as miles, or we have meters as well as yards. So we don't confuse the measuring system with what's being measured. We don't confuse uh, gallons uh, or quarts with liters or ounces with milliliters. We know as formal operational thinkers that it's important to have a measuring system, something that is objective, that allows us to compare things to each other, but that that doesn't exist in the object itself. Even something like weight, where we say, oh, this is a half a pound and this is a pound, it can just as easily be described as uh, grams and kilograms. So, right? Uh, concrete operational children gain the ability to use measuring systems. In fact, they see the world as being measurable and they compare th those measurements to each other. But one of their limitations is that they still confuse what they're measuring with what the world is really like. Uh, in a slightly different example, you know, a school-aged child uh, might compare how he or she is doing. Uh, my friend got an A minus, I got a B plus, uh, my other friend got a C plus. One friend is smarter than me, the other one is not so smart. Uh, they don't take into account for example, the amount of effort involved in getting a grade or the amount of motivation involved in getting a grade. We as abstract or formal operational thinkers, uh, our understanding of how to measure and compare ourselves to others is much more uh, sophisticated. Well, if I had to describe the primary gains of the concrete operational stage, I would certainly focus on just a couple. One of them would be conservation and that is our ability to understand and evaluate change. How do I know that when something has changed, it is still the same or not? How do I know that five dimes is the same as two quarters? Right? How do I compare things that look different perceptually to ascertain or determine whether they're the same or not? What we saw when we talked about pre-operational kids is that they frequently confuse what they perceive with what is real and make mistakes as a result. But school-aged children generally, as they develop their concrete conservation skills, are better able to understand change or transformation and to evaluate whether something has really changed or not. This doesn't happen all at once. In fact, uh, some of the more complex forms of conservation don't start being consistently used until the very end of middle childhood. But children become able to compare length, for example, or, uh, or number uh, in simple arithmetic ways. What's a, what's a lot? What's a little? When you break something into pieces, has it changed in quantity? Uh, starting as early as age seven and eight. Some of the more complicated kinds of conservations are things like uh, volume. Even today, when I go to the grocery store and I see two containers that are different shapes, I have to take somebody's word for it that they have the same amount in size, inside them in terms of size. Because volume is a, a space that we can't observe directly. And therefore, we often still get confused about it. Length is one dimension that we can measure pretty easily by contrast. Another change that's important cognitively is the ability to classify objects and events. Children increasingly organize uh, the things in their lives according to shared characteristics and importantly they become more flexible in terms of how they reorganize things in their lives. Uh, children can learn to play cards, for example, because they have four suits and you can arrange them by suit or by color or number or by uh, uh, all kinds of combinations that allow you to play various kinds of card games. Uh, the combinations can be uh, multiple in nature. If you're playing gin rummy, you can have three in a row of one color, or you can have three of the same number, if you will. So kids' abilities to classify and to reorganize cl classifications flexibly is a real advance as well. 
uh, children become better able at what's called seriation, finally. Seriation is the ability to rank or order things and compare them along a dimension. So that kids can begin to look at what's good, better, and best. They can arrange their preferences and they can decide what they would like or not like to do. Um, this allows them to uh, make more decisions in their daily lives and to arrange not just the immediate moment, but arrange things over time. If they have a project to do in school, they can organize it so they'll get done with certain things first, other things later, and the final product is some kind of combination. So the ability to arrange things and the ability to form categories has direct effects on the uh, cognitive energies and abilities of school-age kids. Just a couple of uh, other examples quickly about school-age changes that I would mention. Uh, one, of course, is informational. Kids are able to take in and absorb a lot more factual information in the period from 6 to 12. Why, sometimes our kids, even in the 4th and 5th and 6th grade, will know more about something than we know because it's an interest of theirs and they've read about it and they've, they'll tell you all kinds of facts and kids love those books of facts and information to read about. Uh, children's memory abilities improve enormously during this period. They can retain those facts that they're learning and that information because they're able to organize information better and store it in their long-term memories in multiple ways. So they forget less. And finally, children's ability to use attention improves dramatically during this period. Uh, first of all, they're more conscious of the need to pay attention and become less distractible. But secondly, they can shift their attention, what cognitive psychologists call uh, selectively attend to certain things and not to others. They can decide what's important. So for example, as children move through middle childhood, they develop better study habits and study skills. They learn what they need to pay attention to, and they learn how to use memory strategies to help them remember and retain what they need to know. They'll rehearse information and practice it over time, for example. They'll group things together to more effectively retain them. So altogether, kids' ability to take in information, to organize it, and to retain it improve a lot in middle childhood. As kids move into adolescence, uh, Piaget says they enter this, what he calls a formal operational stage. And I'll just briefly say that the primary differences, and they're important ones, are that formal operational thinking allows us to think abstractly, number one. Abstraction means to think objectively about things that we cannot observe directly. Uh, adolescents and adults can think more realistically, for example, about history than can school-age kids, particularly history of a long time ago. Uh, we can think and plan our futures more effectively and more realistically. Where do I need to, uh, where do I want to be five years from now? And what kinds of things do I need to do to be in that position that I want to be in? So the ability to think abstractly has many important consequences. Adolescents and adults as formal operational thinkers can also think uh, in more uh, systematic and hypothetical ways. We can ask what if. Uh, we can form hypotheses that then can be tested in systematic ways so that we can determine the accuracy of our beliefs. And uh, we're not just quantitatively better than this, uh, than school-age children are, we're qualitatively better. We take into account more variables. We arrange them in terms of probable influence. So that when we have to solve a problem, we don't just start uh, and, and come up with the first trial and error plan that we're faced with. We systematically try to figure out what's most likely to be the answer, or what two or three things do I need to pay attention to. Uh, the last part of this cognitive change uh, in terms of formal operational thinking that I'd like to mention is what a psychologist at Tufts, David Elkind, called adolescent egocentrism. He says that adolescents, particularly early adolescents, tend to become increasingly self-conscious. And their thinking uh, reflects this. He used two terms which he coined, one called the imaginary audience, 
which was the mistaken belief that adolescents have that others share their concerns and opinions that they share. So that if I'm self-conscious about how I look or about a given ability, I assume that others are focusing their attention on that as well, for better or for worse. If I think I'm, I look great when I'm going out, I assume everybody else will think the same way, even though others might not. And if I'm self-conscious of my uh, height or my weight, I may assume that, oh, everybody else shares that same opinion. Luckily, the imaginary audience uh, begins to decline over time as we become better able to distinguish between our own thoughts and perceptions of ourselves and how others might see us. The other example that Elkind uses is what he calls the personal fable. He says that adolescents begin to have thoughts that are abstract for the first time and they feel about those thoughts that they're unique to them. They begin to question their beliefs and their values. They begin to wonder about society. And they have these powerful thoughts which are their own. And they tend to exaggerate their sense of uniqueness, either their sense of specialness, I'm the first one who thought of this, or their sense of alienation. Nobody else knows what this is like. So that uh, the personal fable is an exaggeration of one's own thoughts and the assumption that others are not having the same kinds of thoughts. Uh, one example of this I'll give you, for instance, uh, adolescence is a period of somewhat more risk, in part because developmentally, teenagers may uh, underestimate the risk that they're in. They feel invincible. They think bad things can't happen to them. And furthermore, they're not that good at considering the consequences of an act that they may engage in. So as an adult, you may look at that adolescent and say, what were you thinking? How could you do that? And the answer is, they weren't really thinking. <laughs> that is, they couldn't determine what the level of risk was in doing something uh, or in the moment that there might be some consequences that they uh, uh, should look out for. Again, by later adolescence, the ability of uh, teens to uh, have a sense of the possible consequences or to use thinking to modify impulses improves dramatically. And uh, by high school years, uh, we are much better able to understand that what we think and feel about ourselves may or may not be shared by others, uh, but that they're not one and the same thing. Well, there are a lot of other cognitive topics I could bring up here, but uh, for example, language use and humor and uh, uh, figurative speech and the like. But I'll leave that to you in your readings. Uh, I hope you find a lot of interest uh, in what you're reading in these two chapters this week.